Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Tam. I am a director with ITL and CA Networks, and I'm the director responsible for administering the 2L summer OCI process for all ITL and NCA candidates. So I'm going to go through what the summer recruitment process is, what these jobs are about, and how ITL and CA candidates sort of fit into the structured recruit. So first and foremost, um, as a director of ITL NCA Network, uh, you know, I love working with internationally trained lawyers. I'm an internationally trained lawyer myself, as are all the other directors of ITL NCA Networks. We got together really to form this association to help other ITLs um, help expand our reach and help everybody sort of navigate the Canadian legal landscape from accreditation to beyond and into your career. We're here as a resource for you um, and here to sort of connect you with uh, everybody else who's in the Canadian legal market. There's a lot of information out there about what um, 2L summer recruitment is, what these on-campus interviews are, what second year summer positions mean, and we know that it's a very confusing process. Um, and so when in doubt, make sure that you go to the primary sources of the information and don't just listen to everybody trying to inform each other because there's a lot of misinformation that is out there. So the first resource I want to make sure that you're all aware of is ITL and, uh, ITLN.ca. It is the main website for the ITLNCA networks and through there you can find resource links on how to participate in the second year summer position recruit, how to open up your bylaw portal account. As well, there are lots of videos on our YouTube that um, are about application materials, about interview preparation, and lots of par past participants, uh, especially of the OCI process um, that have gone through it successfully. And we've recorded all of those interviews for your benefit so that you're aware of what to expect and how to prepare going forward for yourself as well. So ITL and NCA Networks is, of course, one of the primary sources you can refer to. Um, the other things to be mindful of is these are formal recruitment processes that have been established um, by working groups across Canada uh, and the Ontario uh, uh, recruitment process is regulated by the Law Society of Ontario. So you can go on the LSO website at any time to make sure you're aware of what their uh, policies and procedures around the structured recruit are. The Vancouver recruitment process is set by the Vancouver Bar Association, a working group there sets all of the recruitment timelines across all of uh, British Columbia and not regulated, but will follow the Law Society of Alberta rules is the Calgary recruit. So the Calgary recruit is not formally regulated, but all of the schools and employers get together uh, to establish some uh, guidelines that they're going to follow uh, to ensure that there's consistency across all of Alberta. And again, so that they're in line with the LSA guidelines. And um, Ottawa's recruit is also unregulated. So um, Ottawa's IP recruit and the 2L recruit is unregulated. But again, there's a working group within Ottawa that sort of gets together to establish the dates and timelines. So depending on which recruit you're actually interested in, make sure that not only you look at the ITL NCA network website, but to actually look at what the rules and regulations in your jurisdiction specifically are, do that research up front, network with people who've gone through it before. There's been lots of ITLs who've gone through the process across all of Canada. Um, so this is what the ITL NCA Networks website looks like. And you can see right in the top at the second tab, there is the OCI tab, which is all the information you'll need to know about this 2L Summer Recruit. And again, how to start your profile on Vila Portal, um, the portal with uh, which all the uh, 
employers are uh, receiving applications. And you'll see the specific timelines and rules around Ontario, uh, around Vancouver, and around Calgary. All of the timelines across each jurisdiction are different. So really important to be mindful about when you know your applications are due, when um, the OCI call days are, and when the interviews will be. So I've talked a lot about these terms and acronyms, but let me actually explain what summer positions are and why you might consider being a part of them. So uh, firms have always had summer positions in recognition that in the Canadian JD program, there are three years that Canadian law students are going to be in. And so there's a gap in summer between their first and second year. There's also a gap between their second and third year. And then once students have graduated, they're done with school and therefore have more time. And so law firms recognizing that there are a group of students from some of the top law schools in all of Canada having summer breaks develop summer positions as a way to capture those um, law students and incorporate them into their business needs. And as a law firm, knowing that I'll have students um, for their summer months, so, you know, April to July or May to July, which, that's great. There's two or three months of student work I can assign them, you know, um, going to court, drafting documents, doing legal research, appearing uh, in motions. And so being able to sort of have that student work is great. There's always work that has to be done at that level. And so I potentially can have one L summer students and two L summer students, which means these are positions that take place during the summer months and typically are capturing people who are free during those summer months because as Canadian JD students, they wouldn't be in school because there are no summer classes for JD programs across Canada. Now, as a law firm, if I know that I'm going to have students at least from May to July, that's great, but I have student work all year around. So I need to have students doing work, legal research, drafting, all of those things from August all the way till June to cover off the rest of the time period. And so because these summer positions are about two months long and I have student work that takes all takes up all of year all the year round. That is why historically articling has been 10 months so that I can have JD students who are in their 1L and 2L summers for those summer months. But then once they've graduated from their third year, I can have them for 10 months fully so that across all of the 12 months of the year, I always have a consistent rotation of students who are going to do that student level of work. And so hopefully that explains to you that these dates and these periods, that articling being 10 months, that these summer rolls being two months are not arbitrary. They're serving a need within these larger law firms who always have um, work to assign the student level. And that is also the difference. A 1L summer position is a two-month job, um, and the expectation is that the person who's taking up that 1L summer job has about two more years before they're going to be a licensing candidate. Same with a 2L summer role. This is somebody who's potentially between their second and third year of a Canadian JD, which means that they're about a year away from licensing. Whereas articling is somebody who is currently in the licensing process and needs to fulfill that 10-month experiential component. Now, those of you who are in Ontario, there's also what's called the Law Practice Program placements, and that, that satisfies um, the uh, alternative pathway to the experiential component of licensing in Ontario. And so you can either do the articling or the Law Practice Program, Law Practice Program being a simulated work environment um, where you are are in four months expected to get exposure and competency in every area of law. And then it's followed by a four month real world placement in a real uh, legal department or law office. So those are the differences between all of these programs and why firms have these programs is so that they are always aware of what group of students are going to come into their law office at any given time.
One of the major reasons why firms will have uh, a 2L recruitment is because they're able to hire a lot of students over that summer break, train them, start the training process, start seeing the caliber of work they're able to produce, and in selecting that group, they can usually select all of their articling students from that pool. And you'll see that a lot of the firms who are participating in the summer recruitment process, very few of them will also externally um, hire for articling uh, positions, or if they are participating in the articling recruit, they're only um, recruiting for a handful of spots as compared to more spots for the summer position because, again, they use the pool of summer students to draw their articling class from, and then they'll use their articling class to draw their first year associates from. And so in many ways, it's a way to get their uh, preferred candidates and employees right from the get-go, have multiple years before um, they're ready to be called to the bar, have that opportunity to work with them over the longer period of time so that once they are a called associate, they're able to contribute to the law firm right away. In some jurisdictions, this is a much clearer pipeline, especially in places like, for example, Calgary and some of the firms in Vancouver um, and, and many of the big national firms in Toronto. Uh, they very heavily will rely on their 2L summer uh, applicant pool to select their summer students, and then the majority of their articling students will be drawn from that pool, and then the majority of their first-year associates will also be drawn from that pool. Which means to you, if you are really interested in some of these firms that do the 2L recruitment, that don't externally recruit for articling, then it might make more sense for you to be a part of this process. The caveat to that being, again, there are thousands of other firms out there that exist and not every single firm will recruit through second year summer positions. Some of them will recruit also on an off cycle um, ad hoc basis as their needs increase over the year. And so don't worry that you've missed anything if you've missed a summer recruit or if you've missed an articling recruit. There are opportunities that come up, just maybe not at the specific firms that participate in the formal summer recruit uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, and so do I have to do 2L to be an articling student? Absolutely not. Again, it's only the specific firms who do this big structured formal recruit for the 2L as a pipeline to their articling students, as a pipeline to their associates that will be um, beneficial for you to participate. It will be much more difficult because there are fewer positions as an articling student who is coming in not through the second year summer recruit route at these specific firms. But again, there are thousands of other firms, many of which don't consider summer students at all, many who only hire articling students as their, summer, uh, as their group um, of student work. And then there are lots of legal departments and legal offices that recruit in different ways as well. And so what if you don't get a 2L? It's not the end of the world. Again, many of you are not even on this timeline where you are two years away from licensing or a one year away from licensing. And that's the biggest thing that you need to be mindful of, especially if you are deciding to participate in the second year summer recruit. It's that as an ITL, as an NCA candidate, you are equivalent to a Canadian JD student. And so as you are continuing to finish and satisfy your NCA requirements, regardless of whether you're an LLM student, regardless of whether or not you're called in another jurisdiction, in the eyes of what you're allowed to do in law in terms of rights of appearance, the types of assignments you're allowed to work on, the types of supervision you're required to have, you're considered equivalent to um, a law student who is still in the studying process. And it's not until you've satisfied your NCA requirements and received your certificate of qualification that you're eligible to enter the licensing process and start either articling or the law practice program. And so being mindful of what your timeline are to satisfy your NCA requirements, whether or not you're finishing a graduate program with one of the Canadian law schools, you then also have a sense of, am I expecting to be in the licensing process in a year or am I expecting to be in the licensing process in two years?
And for those of you who are considering these two L positions, you have to be mindful that the expectation is that you are expecting to license in two years, not in one, because again, the firms will want you to summer with them for next summer, so summer of 2025 currently, and then we'll consider you for the articling group in summer of 2026. I get many questions from participants asking, but what if I do the summer, can I get the articling right after that? And that is very rare that that would happen. It's not impossible. But again, like I said, th these firms usually have these recruitment process well in advance of what their needs are. So again, if I'm a if I'm a law firm that takes two all summer students and considers their art my articling pool from them, for example, if I'm a firm accepting applications for this uh, next due date uh, this summer for roles of summer 2025, I'm I've also ex uh, started with a pool of students who started this summer, and I'm already considering that group for articling of 2025. Whereas the summer students who are going to start in 2025, they're going to be considered for articling in 2026. And the only times that I would maybe have a, an extra spot for articling is if one of my students drops out. So they decide to move to another firm, they decide to take a clerkship instead, they decide to take uh, a break from their legal studies or practice, and therefore one of my articling students would have dropped out. And if you then become the person who is eligible at that point, I might consider you or I might look externally. That's not the common scenario, despite what a lot of NCA candidates hope, that they hope that they can start articling right after their summer. A lot of these big firms typically already have their pool, um, and so it's very rare for you to be considered for articling right after your summer. Um, again, if you are considering these summer positions, expect that you're going to be two years out from licensing, but especially at these larger law firms where this is the recruitment process, it's more important to be a part of their recruitment process and timeline than it is to make sure that you are called at the time that you want. Because if you want to be at these firms, then you really have to be mindful that this is how they want to be training their people. And this is the amount of time they want to be spending with these people. Again, this is a very small subset of firms. These are the largest firms across Canada, the multinational firms. Um, as well as some of the biggest government agencies. This is not the thousands of other firms that exist out there that do sort of articling recruitment and a recruitment ad hoc that is not sort of structured with the law society timelines. Um, the, the one thing that I also get questions on all the time is, should I apply for this 2L round if I have submitted an articling application already? And that's up to you to decide. The only thing that you need to remember is it's probably the same group of people who are looking at your applications. And so you do want to make sure that you are tailoring it for each of the jobs. A 2L and 1L position is slightly different from articling, and the programming that they have at the firms for both 2L and articling are going to be different. And so you want to make sure that you're applying for that job specifically and not applying just generally and submitting the same application because if they didn't select you for one of the recruitments you want to make sure that any subsequent application you submit is even better and so speaking to sort of what your timeline is again if you are eligible for summer of next year meaning you're two years away from licensing um, you want to be mindful also what kind of things you're going to be applying to so what is your timeline? Again, do you have a tentative plan for when you're expecting to finish and satisfy all of your NCA requirements? And if so, then what, what kind of roles before you get your CQ should you be applying for? And what kind of roles after your CQ should you be applying for? And it all depends on when the job starts. So like I said, before you obtain your CQ, you're eligible for all of the jobs that um, are equivalent to a summer student role. If by the time that articling position starts, you have received your CQ, 
then you can apply for the articling positions for that job. The employer just cares that you can start the job when the job starts. And it's your job as the applicant to make clear where you are in the process and whether or not you will be eligible to start that job for when it starts. Again, it's your job to be aware of that timeline and convince the employer that that timeline makes sense. I see a lot of NCA candidates who apply for positions and it's unclear what their timeline is. They just say, I'm an NCA candidate or I'm in an LLM program, but there's no indication of when they're finished their accreditation or when they're going to be a licensing candidate. Or often I'll see um, applications for 2L positions that say things like, I want to be your articling student. I want to do the articling program. Again, not recognizing that they're applying for the summer role, the two-month position in the hopes of articling for the next year. So apply for the job that you're applying for, not just the job you hope for, and hope that the employers understand what your timeline is. You have to make that clear. And so for the Law Society of Ontario, a uh, first year uh, summer student, a first year summer position is for those people who are expected to be in the licensing process, planning to article in two years or more after that summer role. And the Law Society defines a second year, second year summer position, again, Typically for JD students, this would be somebody who's in their second year, uh, between their second and third year study, meaning they're one year away from licensing. That would be the same for all of you NCA candidates, which is I am going to be doing this summer role next summer with the hopes of licensing in 2026 and beyond. The difficulty with these recruitment timelines is they happen so early in advance. And so you'll see 1L positions, so the 1L summer positions for summer of 2025, the application deadline is going to be January of 2025. But the second year summer positions that we're talking about for summer of 2025, those applications are due next week, so July of 2024. And the articling applications that have just passed um, in June, those were for articling positions in 2025 as well. And so again, the important thing is you should apply for the job if you are eligible to start that job when that job starts. And for articling, that means you've get your CQ before the time that that job starts, you're able to apply for it. You don't have to wait for your CQ to apply for it, but you need to make sure you're making clear what your plan to getting your CQ is and that it is in, in advance of the time that that position starts. For summer positions, you don't need to have your CQ. You don't need to have your CQ even to do the job because as a summer position, you're not expected to be a licensing candidate until the year after. And so being a part of this recruit is fine, making sure that you don't have your NCA um, CQ. Again, not necessary. Your CQ is only required in advance of any part of licensing, not any of the summer rules. And I have to, have to, have to remind everyone, lots of recruiters recruit outside of this process. It's just the biggest base street firms, the national firms, the multinational firms, and some of the biggest government organizations. But in the whole uh, legal community, that's a small subset of firms. There's thousands of other firms out there who recruit as their needs are. So make sure you take a look at their website. Um, so I'd like to in advance of this slide to sort of explain why um, we're running these recruitment cycles for ITLs, despite it being such a small subset of firms. Um, partly it's because these are the top firms in all of Canada, the top government organizations in all of Canada. And traditionally, again, this entire recruitment process was directed at Canadian JD students, right? It's the Canadian students timelines that these summer roles exist on. And it's why, um, after graduation from a Canadian program, articling is 10 months, because again, this entire recruitment process was structured and built for Canadian JD students. And so historically, NCA candidates and ITLs who are not a part of these processes have been excluded. Another reason it's come about is because what on-campus interviews are, so OCIs, 
On-campus interviews are the first stage of interviews for selection of these summer positions. And so again, I'll compare it to what the JD process is. In June and July, when these applications are due, a law firm will then look at all of the students who've applied from a specific school, and then they will select a couple of those people from each school to interview. On-campus interviews are called that because once they've once the employer has selected candidates from each of the Canadian schools that they want to uh, interview, they then used to fly out to every single law school in the fall and actually interview those students. So they would go to UBC, they would go to U of Calgary, they would go to U of Ed, uh, uh, Alberta, they would then you know, fly to U of Saskatchewan, make their way across the Canada to U of T, to Osgood, and then make their way out east further to uh, New Brunswick and Dalhousie. And then they would interview each of the students they've selected at each of the schools. NCA candidates are not a part of a school. Um, many of you are self-studying. Many of you are just a part of challenging exams directly with NCA. Can, uh, with NCA. Um, and even those of you who are affiliated with a school in a graduate diploma, in an LLM program, in a foreign trained lawyers program, you're not in the same pool of students as the JDs because they're looking at on Phylaw Portal for all of the JD students from each of those schools. And so historically, ITLs and NCA candidates have been excluded from the selection process. And it was one of our former directors, Sam, who realized I can do something about it. And so she, uh, along with a bencher from the Law Society, sort of set up this stream where by all NCA candidates across all of Canada can be considered their own pool. And now ITL NCA Network serves as the organizing body for this pool of students. And so now employers will select all of the JD students from each of the Canadian schools, but they'll also reach out to ITL NCA Network and say, hey, out of all of the NCA candidates, these are the candidates we want to interview during the structured recruitment process. And so it's through this inclusion that we have uh, been running this for the last six years. I've been running it for this year and last year, and I hope uh, to continue on and help any other directors who come on board with this process because we want to make sure that ITLs and NCA candidates are still able to get into the pipeline of recruitment for some of these bigger national firms and government organizations. And so to that end, there's an application due date. Employers then send their preferred candidates to ITL NCA networks. The ITL NCA networks and all of the different Canadian schools will set out the schedule of interviewing according to the specific interview dates that they've been given. And then ITL NCA networks will call each of you who have received an offer for an interview to let you know that somebody's interested, you can then accept uh, an offer for interview or you can decline if you so choose. If you've accepted an offer for an interview, then ITL NCA Networks will organize the information and the logistics of the day to make sure that especially if you have multiple interviews that they don't conflict, that you're not having to interview with um, different people at the same time. Uh, and then we will then send out the information about the time uh, and the date of your interview and any logistics that we've been given from the firms themselves, whether they're using Zoom, WebEx, um, or uh, any other platform, they'll let you know. It's uh, all virtual at this point, so whether you're doing Vancouver, Calgary, or Ontario, all of the OCIs now are going to be virtual for you, so you just have to make sure that you have a working internet connection, a very good camera, um, and that you're practicing uh, interviewing virtually. After, vir uh, after OCIs are completed, the uh, employers take over the rest of the recruitment process. So again, the OCIs are the first stage of interviews. There's always going to be a second stage of interviews, which is the in-person interviews. And so you'll get it, you're going to get a call to see if you've been invited to in-person interviews. There's an interview week in the fall, as I mentioned. And so the interview um, 
schedule will be dictated by the employers and you'll be meeting in person with all the different employers during that interview week. There's also sometimes a social element to some of the interview weeks, dinners and receptions, um, networking events that uh, you're expected to attend as a candidate who's being considered for the 2L recruit, uh, and then ultimately offers of employment will go out. And again, the Law Society or the VBA or even the Law Society of Alberta will outline a lot of these requirements and timelines. But always refer to ITLNCA's website. Uh, we have all of these timelines also set out for each jurisdiction, so you can follow those really clearly. So in terms of preparing for these OCIs, these on-campus interviews, they are very different kind of interview. OCIs are 17-minute interviews where um, the employers have back-to-back 17-minute interviews all day for all of the candidates that they're interested in selecting. And so for you, in preparing for these 17-minute interviews, you have to know your resume inside out. You know, you have to have a few relevant stories, proving your abilities, proving your impressiveness, proving the experiences that you've had um, from your past jurisdiction or um, in your past previous work. I want to make sure that you also all practice your responses out loud. It's really common for law students uh, and NCA candidates, lawyers, in fact, to know what they're going to say and think about what they're going to say. But especially for those of you where English is not your first language, it's really important to practice your answers out loud because we always think clearer than how we speak. And in 17 minutes, clarity of thought, the conciseness of speech, how eloquent you are is going to be crucial in getting your point across as to why you are such an impressive candidate and why you would make such a good candidate. In terms of preparing answers, again, go to the video resources we have. There's so many videos from our past participants, um, people who've gone through the OCI process before. I've also run a networking and interview tips uh, video um, that's recorded on there as well. So refer to all of that if you can. And again, practice your grant, uh, answers out loud. Don't overscript your answers either. It sounds very robotic when people prepare scripted answers. And part of what Canadian interview styles are like is they're conversational, they're informal, they're interpersonal. And so you want to make sure you're actually engaging with whoever's asking you the question and not just trying to remember your prepared scripted answer. Do your research on the firms. Hopefully you've been networking with them and attending events, attending firm hops. And so you'll bring in some of that information into your uh, interview questions. Hopefully you've read up on the profiles of some of the firm pro, uh, lawyers and you'll be able to maybe um, ask them questions directly or refer to sort of the work uh, that the firm is doing or the programming that they offer um, and ask sort of interesting, insightful questions that you couldn't have otherwise just found out on your own. Um, but it's always important to have sort of one or two questions at the end of an uh, uh, interview just to show your continued interest and that you are sort of engaged and have done your research on the firm already. Uh, Usually in the 17-minute interviews, there's one or two interviewers. Typically, it's one recruiter or one of their articling student committee and maybe uh, an alternative of associates, partners, or directors that get asked for the different interviews across the different days, depending who, on who's available. So it, within those 17 minutes, you're doing an introduction, you're trying to develop rapport with each person. Um, the employers are having a hard job of trying to really out of all of the candidates that they've decided to interview in 17 minute increments decide, is this somebody who would fit in with our firm? Is this somebody who seems excited about this opportunity? Do we feel excited about maybe selecting them to move on? And so again, try not to script your answers too much because you want to make sure you're developing rapport and connecting with your interviewers. And it is hard to do that in 17 minutes. There's going to be questions about your resume, your experiences, what skills you bring, um, some of the challenges you faced, accomplishments that you've had, maybe the interests you've listed on your resume. They're going to go through that quite um, systematically, depending on how much they want to know, depending on how much you've already told them in your application. 
Again, it's an opportunity uh, for you to ask questions as well. And remember, the firms are trying to impress you with their firm just as much as you are trying to impress them with who you are. And so the firm also gets an opportunity to present themselves, who they are, the personalities that are at their firm, and sort of the value at being at their firm. Make uh, So the questions that you get asked during these interviews are ones that typically probe and assess if you have the skills that they're looking for. And all of you sort of know what the skills a uh, employer is looking for at the student level, right? Your analytical abilities, your problem solving abilities, your legal research and writing abilities, your drafting abilities. And so make sure you have prepared what are the examples of the most impressive versions of those skills that I have? Because every single JD applicant, every single NCA candidate can do legal research, can do drafting, can advocate, but not everyone has maybe done it at the level that you have done it. Not everyone has worked on the files that you might have worked on in your home jurisdiction. And just because they're from another jurisdiction does not mean that it's not valuable, but it's your job to convey to me how invaluable that experience is, how those skills are relevant and transferable, and how they relate to why you're applying for this job. A lot of the questions you'll be asked are also open-ended questions, and so very few uh, times will the question be very closed and just a yes or no question. It will be things like, oh, can you describe this or can you tell me about this, designed to open up and get you to engage and explain your situation a little bit further, to get you to expand on things and give the uh, interviewer a chance to sort of connect with you on different topics and and sort of maybe follow up on some of the things that you've said or follow up on some of the answers that um, they've given in response to your questions as well. So they tend to be very open-ended questions. And finally, they'll also give you questions geared towards your interest in the firm. Why are you interested in the firm? Have you sort of, again, connected beyond just looking at the firm website and their masthead? Have you developed any connections with their current students, with their current associates? Have you had any conversations with the recruiters, with the um, partners at the firm? So they're really trying to see, compared to everyone else who's interested in their firm, have you made a concerted effort to make yourself stand out and to integrate yourself with the people who are at this firm already? So you can see it takes a lot of work before you send in your application, but also as you're going through the recruitment process to be making these connections and to be sort of engaging with them in a whole meaningful way so that you get a sense of what you're getting into and whether or not this is a place that you'd like to be at. What are firms looking for? So again, you know the kinds of skills that um, firms are looking for, but in broad scopes, they're looking for sort of intellectual skills, right? Are you thoughtful? Do you have good judgment, good analytical skills? Are you curious? Um, they're also looking for people who are motivated, who are excited, they're driven, they have enthusiasm, they have resilience, maybe they've overcome challenges. ITLs, NCA candidates have overcome many challenges. So what are the things that you can talk about in terms of what you've gone through and and how you are a better person, a better lawyer, a better candidate because of it. They're also really carefully trying to see what your interpersonal skills are. And here's where some of the cultural differences will come into play. Part of these interviews, they're trying to see in those 17 minutes, can you present yourself professionally and confidently? And would they be concerned if they introduced you to a Canadian client of theirs that you would be representing their brand in the professional way that they're expecting you to? And what that means for some of you is learning what the Canadian culture requires. And for some of you, that means being less deferential to people who are your superiors or having to speak up a little bit more than you're used to to sound more confident. Again, some of these are just minimal cultural barriers that you sort of have to overcome and shift your tone in once you get into the legal um, practice. It's not about changing who you are, but realizing that in the professional context, this is how they want you to present yourself. So knowing how to do that and how to engage people is sort of half of the battle there. But they're going to be trying to assess how articulate you are, how mature you are, and whether or not you can be part of their team. They are looking, again, to try to 
connect with you in some meaningful way. And so those open-ended questions are really a chance to get to know who you are and whether or not they'd like to shortlist you for in-person interviews further down the line. And they're really trying to see what is your interest in our firm and our practice areas. Hopefully, it's not just one niche area that you're interested in. Hopefully, it's not just the opportunity to learn and grow with the best firm. Because to be frank, all of these firms think they're the best, think they're the top firms, and they already know that. What is your specific reason for wanting to be at this firm as compared to any other firm is what you're trying to get across and what they're listening for. And so that's it for the structured part of my presentation. You can see um, one of the things I tried to do here is show you that there's lots of different application timelines for some of these summer roles that are separate from articling student roles. And you'll see that especially in geographic business centers like Calgary, like Vancouver, like Toronto, those typically are at the ends of the cycles for the geographic area because the smaller locations, the more regional locations will want to secure their students before the big city centers get um, the bulk of the application. So they don't want to lose any of their candidates to the bigger city centers, which means some of the deadlines for the more regional areas in the different uh, provinces will be a little bit earlier than the big deadline for the bigger cities. Uh, so all that to say, there's lots of opportunities out there. Make sure you know your own timeline. Make sure you know what you are and are not eligible for. If you are interested in participating in the summer recruit, please do so knowing that you are a one year or two years away from licensing, and that is the expected timeline that you're going to be on. Best of luck to all of you who are applying. Make sure you take a look at our resources on our video uh, library. Again, lots of past interviews, um, lots of past uh, uh, career resources for application tips, interview tips. I'll, fi I'll finish to say that last year was a really strong OCI recruit. Um, so we had about 125 students who had uh, been asked for over 300 interviews with these different firms for these summer positions. And if you put that in context, that is the size of a full law school. Most law schools have about 120, 130 students, um, and most law schools are receiving requests for interviews at that rate as well. So there's lots of opportunities for you to stand out, um, but make sure that you are making use of all of the resources that we offer to ensure that you are exactly who the firms are looking for and are as prepared as you can be. So that's it for my presentation. I'm going to stop the recording now.